Testing. All right, everyone, hello. Welcome to GTC this morning. How's everyone doing? Good. We're nice and awake, excited. Well, today I'm happy to, my name is Nathan Horrocks. I work for NVIDIA. Um, I get to kind of dabble in gym stuff sometimes, so very excited to be here. I'm just going to dive right into it. Um, Jim Fan is a research manager and co-lead of Embodied AI here at NVIDIA. His primary focus is developing generally capable autonomous agents. To tackle this grand challenge, his research spans foundation models, policy learning, robotics, multi multimodal learning, and large-scale systems. He, he obtained his PhD in computer science from Stanford. Um, he wanted to keep it short so he can get just right into it. So for, um, without further ado, please welcome Jim Fan. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming so early in the morning. I know it's a bit too early for Bay Area time, so thanks everybody. Um, so I want to tell you guys a story about um, the spring of 2016 when I was taking a class at Columbia University, but um, I wasn't actually paying attention to the lecture. And instead, I was watching a board game tournament on my laptop. And it wasn't just any tournament, but a very, very special one. So the match was between DeepMind, AlphaGo, and LisaGo. And the AI just won three out of five games and became the first ever to beat a human champion at the game of Go. So I still remember the adrenaline of seeing history unfold, the moment of glory when AI agents finally enter the mainstream. But when the excitement fades, I realized that as mighty as AlphaGo was, it can only do one thing and one thing alone. It is not able to play any other games, like Super, Mar Super Mario or Minecraft, and it certainly cannot do your dirty laundry um, or dishes. But what we truly want are AI agents as versatile as Wally, -E, as diverse as all the robot forms or embodiments in Star Wars, and works across infinite worlds, virtual or physical, as in Ready Player One. So how do we get there in possibly the near future? So this is your hitchhiker's guide to general purpose AI agents. Most of the ongoing research efforts can be laid out across these three axes. The number of skills an agent can do, the embodiments it can control, and the realities it can master. And this is where AlphaGo is, but the upper right corner is where we all want to go. So I've been thinking for most of my career about how to travel across this galaxy of challenges towards this upper right corner. And earlier this year, I had a great fortune to establish Gear Lab with Jensen's support and blessing. And I'm very proud of the name. Uh, Gear, G-E-A-R, stands for Generalist Embodied Agent Research. I'm co-leading this initiative with uh, Yuko Zhu. Uh, and this is a picture that we took seven years ago uh, at Stanford, where Yuko and I were both still PhD students at uh, Fefe Lee's group. And we did robotics hackathons all the time because, you know, especially before deadlines, we were the most productive. Um, and here, Ajay on the left is from uh, Adidas group, also at NVIDIA Research, working very closely with Gear. And all three of us basically moved from Stanford to NVIDIA. And man, we were so young at that time. Look at what PhD did to us. You know, the quest for AGI is a lot of pain and suffering. So let's go back to the first principles. What essential features does a journalist agent need? And I would argue three things. First, it should be able to survive, navigate, and explore in an open-ended world. And AlphaGo has a singular goal, and it's simply not open-ended. And second, world knowledge. The agent should have a large amount of pre-trained knowledge instead of knowing only a few concepts in the environment. And third, as a journalist agent, the name implies, it must be able to perform more than a few tasks, ideally infinitely multitask. You prompt it with any reasonable language, and the agent should be able to complete that mission for you. So what does it take? Correspondingly, the environment needs to be open-ended enough because the agent's complexity is upper bounded by the environment complexity. And planet Earth that we live on is actually a perfect example because the Earth is so open-ended 
that it enables an algorithm called natural evolution to produce all the diverse behaviors of life on this planet. So can we have a simulator that is essentially a lo-fi Earth, but we can still run on our lab computers? And second, we need to provide the agent with massive pre-training data because exploration from scratch in such an open-ended world is simply intractable. And this data will be a reference manual on how to do things, and more importantly, what are the interesting things worth doing. And finally, we need a foundation model that's scalable enough to convert this large-scale data into actionable insight. And this train of thought lands us in Minecraft, the best-selling video game of all time. And for those who are not familiar, Minecraft is this procedurally generated world uh, of 3D voxels. And in this game, you can do whatever your heart desires. So what's special about the game is that Minecraft defines no particular score to maximize and no objective to follow. And that makes it very well suited as a truly open-ended environment. And as a result, we see some very impressive creations, like someone built the Hogwarts castle block by block in Minecraft. And someone else, apparently with nothing better to do, built a functional neural network. Because Minecraft has logical gates and is apparently Turing complete. I want to highlight a number here. Minecraft has 140 million active players. And just to put this number in perspective, this is more than twice the population of UK. And it just so hap happens that gamers are generally happier than PhDs. So they love to play and share uh, their journey on online. So this huge you know, human mass of gamers produce a lot of data every day. And the question is, how can we tap into this treasure trove of data? So we introduced MindDojo, a new open framework to help the community develop general, uh, general purpose agents using Minecraft as a kind of primordial soup. So MindDojo has three parts, a simulator, a database, and a model. So the simulator API we built unlocks the full potential of the game for AI research. And we support observation space like RGB and voxel and GPS, and two levels of action space. And MindDojo can be customized at every detail, such as terrains, weathers, and monster spawning. And it also supports creative tasks that are freeform and open-ended. So for example, let's say we want the agent to build a house. But what makes a house a house? Right? It's very difficult to implement this kind of success criterion in simple Python code. And the only way is to use foundation models trained on internet scale knowledge so that the abstract concept of a house can be captured. And next, we collected an internet scale knowledge base of Minecraft to help the agent lift off the ground because it's really hard to explore from scratch. And this database got three parts. The first is video. We find that Minecraft is among the most streamed game online, and gamers just like to talk about what they're doing. So we collected more than 300,000 hours of videos with more than 2 billion words in transcript. And the second is Minecraft Wiki, with 7,000 multimodal pages of images, tables, and diagrams. And the third is the Minecraft subreddit, uh, which we found that people use as a kind of stack overflow when they need some help on Minecraft. So here's a peek at our MindDojo Wiki data set. And can you believe that someone listed all the crafting recipes, thousands of them, and explains all the monsters and basically every possible game mechanics you'll ever see in every version of Minecraft? So one thing I learned is that gamers just got a lot of time to kill. <laughs> well, but I, I'm not complaining, right? Because thanks for the data, please do more. Thanks for the data. Now, what to do with the data? It's time to train a foundation model. Here, the idea is very simple. For our YouTube database, we have time-aligned video clips and transcripts. And these are actually real tutorial videos, like here in text prompts 3, as I raise my axe in front of this pig, there's only one thing you know is going to happen. This is actually from a YouTube tutorial. We then can train a pair of encoders to map the video and the transcript to a vector embedding. And then the embeddings um, can be trained 
by a process called contrastive learning, which essentially pulls together video and the text that match and pushes apart those that don't match. And this pair of encoders is called the mind clip model. And intuitively, mind clip learns the association between the video and the transcript that describes the action in the video. It outputs a score between zero and one, and one means perfect description, and zero means that the text has nothing to do with the video. So this effectively becomes a language conditioned foundation reward model that understands the nuances of forest, animal behaviors, architectures, uh, you name it in Minecraft, all the abstract concepts. Now, how do we use MindClip in action? Here, an agent interacts with our MindDojo simulator, and the task is in English, shear sheep to obtain wool. So as the agent explores, it generates a video snippet, which can be encoded and fed to MindClip. And then it computes the association. The higher the score is, the more the agent's behavior is aligned with the text prompt. And that becomes the reward function to any reinforcement learning algorithm that you like. So this looks very familiar, right? Because it's essentially reinforcement learning from human feedback, or ROHF. And ROHF is the cornerstone that powers ChatGPT, and I believe it's gonna play a critical role in embodied agents as well. And here are some demos of our learned agent behavior on various tasks. So let's put MindClip on this hitchhiker's guide. It's able to do a lot more tasks than AlphaGo, but the limitation is that you have to manually decide a task prompt and run training for each skill. And the agent isn't really able to discover new things by itself. But this all changed in 2023, where a model called GPT-4 came. That's a language model so powerful at coding and planning, and so we built Voyager an agent that massively scales on the number of skills. And when we set Voyager loose in Minecraft, it is able to play the game for hours on end without any human intervention. And the video I show here are snippets from a single episode where Voyager just keeps going. It explores the terrains, mine all, all kinds of materials, fight monsters, craft hundreds of recipes, and unlocks an ever-expanding tree of skills. So what's the magic behind it? The key insight is coding as action. We convert the 3D world into a textual representation thanks to an open source Minecraft mod called MindFlayer. Um, and Voyager invokes GPT-4 to generate code snippets in JavaScript. And each snippet becomes an executable skill in the game. And just like human engineers, the program that Voyager writes wouldn't always be correct on the first try. So we have a self-reflection mechanism to help it improve. And the self-reflection relies on three sources, the JavaScript execution error, the agent's current state, like hunger and health, uh, and the world state, um, like the landscape or the monsters nearby. And the agent takes an action, observes the consequence of its action on the world and on itself, reflects on how it could do better, um, try out more actions, and rinse and repeat. And once the skill becomes mature, Voyager stores the program into a skill library. You can think of it as a code library authored entirely by trial and error by GPT-4. And then the agent can retrieve the skills from the library when it sees a similar situation in the future. And in this way, Voyager bootstraps its own capabilities recursively as it explores and experiments in Minecraft. So let's quickly go through an example together. Um, here, the agent's hunger bar has dropped very low, so it needs to find food. And it senses four entities nearby, um, a cat, a villager, a pig, and some wheat seeds. So it starts an inner monologue, right? Do I kill the cat or the villager for food? That sounds like a bad idea. Um, how about the seeds? I can grow a farm, but it's going to take too long. So really sorry, piggy, you are the chosen one. And then it checks the inventory and retrieves an old skill from the library to craft an iron sword, and then learns, starts to learn a new skill called hunt pig. And now we also know that Voyager, unfortunately, isn't vegetarian. So a question still remains. How does Voyager keep exploring indefinitely? 
we give Voyager a high-level directive that is to obtain as many uh, novel items as possible. And Voyager implements a curriculum to find progressively harder and novel challenges to solve. And putting all these together, Voyager is able to master and also discover new skills along the way. And we didn't pre-program any of this. What you see here is called lifelong learning, where an agent is forever curious and forever pursuing new adventures. Um, and these are two bird's eye views of the Minecraft map. The biggest orange circles are the distances that Voyager travels. The agent explores so much because it has to move around to obtain as many no novel items as possible. And because it loves traveling, so that's why we call it Voyager. Now, compared to Mine Clip, Voyager is able to pick up a lot more skills by itself. But it still knows only one, um, it still knows how to control only one body in Minecraft. But can we have a single model that works across different body forms? Enters Metamorph. It is a project that I co-developed with uh, Stanford researchers. We created a foundation model that works on not just one, but thousands of robots with different arm and leg configurations. And Metamorph has no problem adapting to extremely varied kinematic characteristics of different bodies. So here's the intuition. We develop a vocabulary to describe robot parts, and then each body is basically a sentence written in the language of this vocabulary. And more specifically, each robot can be expressed as a graph of joints or kinematic tree. And you can convert the body to a sequence of tokens by traversing this kinematic tree by a depth first search. And each token here represents some physical properties of the joint, and the sequence describes the morphology of the robot. And different robots may have different uh, numbers uh, of joints and configurations, but the tokenizer doesn't care. Right? It's all converted to sequences of different lengths, just like text strings. And what do we do with sequences? Uh, as AI researchers, our knee-jerk reaction is to apply a transformer, and that's exactly what we did. So instead of writing out text, Metamorph writes out motor controls for each joint. And because we want to learn a universal policy that works across morphologies, we batch together all the robot sentences and train a big multitask neural network, just like ChatGPT. And no matter what a robot looks like, it's um, all the same. It's all just sentences uh, to the eye of Metamorph. And we can scale it up by training all the embodiments in parallel with reinforcement learning. And in our experiments, we show that Metamorph is able to control thousands of robots with extremely varied kinematic properties um, to walk upstairs, across irregular terrains, uh, or avoid obstacles. And we also made a fascinating discovery. We found that Metamorph can even generalize zero shot to a morphology that it has never seen before, which means that transformers are able to transfer across embodiments as long as they speak the right language. And let's extrapolate a bit into the future. If we expand the robot body vocabulary even further, I envision that one day, Metamorph 2.0 can generalize to robot arms, dogs, different types of humanoids, and even beyond. So compared to Voyager, Metamorph takes uh, a big stride towards multi-body control. And it's now time to take things to the next level and transfer skills and bodies across realities. Enters Isaac Sim, NVIDIA's simulation initiative. So Isaac Sim's greatest strength is to run physics simulation at a thousand times faster than real time. For example, this character learned impressive martial skills by going through 10 years worth of virtual training in only three days of simulation time on a GPU. So it's very much like the virtual sparring dojo in the movie Matrix. And this race car scene is where simulation has crossed the Uncanny Valley, thanks to hardware accelerated ray tracing. 
we can render very complex worlds with breathtaking levels of details. And the photorealism here can help us train computer vision models that will become the eyes of embodied agents. And what's more, in Isaac Sim, we can procedurally generate infinite worlds, and no two will look the same. So here's an interesting idea. If the agent is trained on 10,000 different simulations, they may as well just generalize to our physical world out of the box, which is simply the 10,000 first reality. So let that sink in. So what new capabilities can Isaac Sim unlock? This is Eureka, an agent that achieves robot dexterity at a superhuman level. Well, maybe not all humans, at least uh, better than myself. Because I have given up on pen spinning a long time ago since childhood, and finally I can have my AI avenge my poor skills. So here's the idea. Isaac Sim has a Python AP API to construct training environments, such as creating a five-finger hand to interact with a pen in the simulation. We also assume that the human-written code specifies a success criteria. For example, if the pen reaches certain 3D orientations consistently. And this success criterion only tells you what to do, but not how to do it with the finger joints. So the first step of Eureka is to pass the environment code and task description as context to GPT-4. And task here is to make the shadow hand spin a pen to a target orientation. And then Eureka samples a reward function. Um, and it is a very fine-grained signal that shapes the behavior of the neural network controller towards a good solution. And normally, uh, expert human engineers will hand-tune this reward function, which is often a very tedious and difficult process. It takes a lot of iterations and also a lot of expertise. Not every engineer can do it if you're not familiar enough with the phys physics simulation. So let's automate it. Once we have a reward function, we can run reinforcement learning to maximize it through lots of trial and error. It only takes about 20 minutes to train a full run for Eureka for one of the reward functions instead of days, thanks to the massively parallel simulation in Isaac Sim. And when the training loop finishes, it returns an automated feedback report that tells Eureka how well that it does. Um, and it also breaks it down to details like different components in the reward function, such as the velocity reward and the posture reward. And putting it together, GPT-4 generates a bunch of reward function candidates and each perform a full reinforcement learning training run. Eureka would pass on the automated feedback and ask the language model to do a self-reflection on the results. And then the language model will reason about where to improve and propose the next generation of reward function candidates and rinse and repeat. So it's kind of like an in-context evolutionary search. And compared to uh, expert humans, Eureka is able to find much better reward functions uh, for each task, like spinning the pen along different axes. They actually require uh, different reward functions for each configuration to work well. And that would be a nightmare for roboticists to just tune it one by one by hand. And trust me, I have tried it before. I wanted to pull my hair out. Uh, GPT-4 just has a lot more patience than any of us. So uh, it's worth noting that Eureka is a general purpose method that bridges the gap between high level reasoning and low level motor control. Uh, Eureka uses a new paradigm that I call hybrid gradient architecture, where a black box inference only large language model instructs a white box learnable neural network. So the outer loop is gradient free and runs GPT-4 to refine the reward function in a coding space. And the inner loop is gradient based and trains um, a reinforcement learning controller to achieve uh, the, the skill that you want to do. 
and you must have both loops to succeed. But the question is, why stop at just a reward function? If you stare hard enough, everything in the robotic stack looks like code, right? Like the task spec, robot hardware spec, uh, and the simulation environments themselves, all can be implemented by code. Is that right? So for example, right, instead of uh, metamorphs special language to describe the body, how about just using uh, something off the shelf like URDF, which people typically use in simulation stacks, and URDF is nothing but an uh, X XML, which can describe the body uh, morphology for the robots. So in the future, I envision that Eureka++ can be a fully automated robotics developer, writing the infrastructure to train better agents and doing so iteratively. So my dream is that one day I can take a very long vacation and Eureka will just keep reporting progress to me while I'm on the beach. So let's see how far away is that. A and don't, le don't let Jensen know. So in this sense, Eureka isn't really a point on our map, but rather a force vector that can push the frontier along any axis. And as we progress through the map, we will eventually reach a single model that generalizes across all three axes. And that upper right corner is the foundation agent. So I believe training foundation agents will be very similar to ChatGPT. All language tasks right, can be expressed as texting and text out, be it um, writing poetry or doing translation or doing math. It's all the same. And training ChatGPT is simply scaling this up across lots and lots of text data. And very similar, the foundation agent will take as input an embodiment prompt and an instruction prompt and output actions. And we simply scale it up massively across lots and lots of realities. So the foundation agent is the next chapter for GearLab. And yesterday, Jensen announced Project Groot in his keynote, a cornerstone initiative on our roadmap. The mission is to create a foundation model for humanoid robots. And why humanoid? Because it is the most general form factor. Because the world that we live in is customized for humans and human habits. And everything that we can do in our daily lives can in principle be implemented on an advanced enough humanoid hardware. So I'm very excited to work with multiple leading humanoid companies around the world so that Groot may transfer even across embodiments. And this is one of my uh, favorite pictures from our GTC preparation, uh, taken in front of NVIDIA's headquarter. Actually, the building behind that is called Voyager. Uh, and here we see uh, Atronic, Fourier, Agility, and Unitree, and just look at how happy they are at the uh, NVIDIA headquarter. So on a high level, Groot takes multimodal instructions such as language, video, and demonstration, and develop skills in simulation as well as the real world. So here's an example of a video instruction. The GR1 robot here from Fourier Intelligence uh, learns to mimic human dance moves from a video. And Groot can also learn from human teleoperated demonstrations, such as Apollo's uh, code press juicing skills, um, so for this demo, we actually bought a lot of fruit at Gear Lab. We got them all reimbursed. Thanks, Jensen. Um, and then um, the, the, the next one is from GR1, also playing the drum um, by following a human teacher's motion. So Groot is born at Oslo a new compute orchestration system to scale up models on DGX and simulation on OVX. And we use Isaac Lab to run lots of different environments for humanoids, hoping that the model will generalize to a variety of skills and embodiments and transfer zero shot across the sim to real gap so that we can scale up the training massively um, on fast simulation powered by GPUs. And now zooming out, I believe in a future where everything that moves will eventually be autonomous. And Project Groot and humanoid robots are only the first chapter. One day, we'll realize 
that the Asians across WALL-E, Star Wars, and Ready Player One, no matter if they are in the virtual or in the physical world, will just be different props to the same foundation agent. And that, my friends, is North Star, our quest for AGI. And please join us on our journey to the moon. Thanks. All right, thanks, Jim, for that. We're going to open up for Q&A here in the, in the session. So there's a, I'm over in the over here. If, if anyone that has a question, they can please line up behind this mic, and we will um, just let them have it. All right. I really appreciate this uh, talk here, Jim, and I'm, I'm excited about the stuff to come. Now, when I look at, say, something like Minecraft, you have your Voyager, which is using GPT-4 to get all this stuff, and then the opposite way of using, say, Dreamer v3 to do this stuff, where it's learning completely from scratch using reinforcement learning. For this foundation agent, which of those two kind of tasks do you think is going to be, or maybe some combination of so? I think that's a great question. Um, and I believe it has to be a kind of combination. Um, because you will have this separation between like system one and system two reasoning. And even humans have that. So system two reasoning is like this slow, deliberate, and high level reasoning. And system one is more like fast, instantaneous, and like motor control. And I think Eureka is one example, right? You have kind of a slow part of the brain that writes a reward function or someday writes kind of the, just the full simulation, all the environments. And then you have a fast part of it using reinforcement learning that controls something like a dexterous hand, which is almost impossible to control directly by something like GPT-4, right? Like how can you control that hand using text-only output? And it's also very slow. You have to do it at hundreds of hertz. So um, I think there's going to be this separation. And they will also do inference at different frequencies, right? Like the system two will do inference at a lower frequency, and system one, much higher frequency. And I feel that's also how humans work as well. We think about certain things, you kind of plan on a global level, and then that planning propagates to your limbs. And you don't really think when I pick up right, this bottle, you, you, you are not really thinking about exactly how you orient each finger and how you're feeling the tactile feedback. You don't, you don't think about it. And that is like another kind of low-level neural network doing the job. OK, thank you very much. Thanks. Hi, Jim. Thank you so much. This is mind-blowing. Uh, I'm Lei Yu, Vice President of Data Science AI at Expression. Uh, I have a question on the first part when you had this uh, uh, mind link as the feedback. Right? In that framework, you call this uh, reinforced learning. Uh, I have a doubt about whether this is anything related to the uh, the GAN framework, where you use the mind link as direct feedback, good or bad, right, as a discriminator. And then your uh, generator generated uh, the actions. Uh, could you please clarify? Yes, uh, I think there are definitely connections here. Um, so I think the um, kind of a closer analogy would be to ROHF, where you're doing kind of reinforcement learning from human feedback. And the human feedback part is learned by human preferences. And uh, here it's actually the same, except that the human preference is not labeled by uh, us hiring contractors to do the job, but by you know, learning from lots and lots of videos because the gamers online, they're already narrating what they're doing. So you have this kind of match between the text and the video for free. And you can use this as a kind of signal um, to make sure that whatever the agent is doing, the video that it generates matches the text prompt. Um, you know, by optimizing for this reward function. So um, I do think this functions a little bit like a discriminator, um, but uh, the difference is now it is language conditioned. So it's a much more powerful kind of reward model, a much more powerful discriminator. Yeah. So can you say that uh, your discriminator is a language conditioned discriminator? I, I, um, I think so. It's kind of a language conditioned, you know, ranking, right? Ranking if the video is, Thank you. Or, or your actions are good or, good or not. So it is a kind of discriminator. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Jim. Nice talk. Uh, I'm, a oh, uh, I'm a researcher from UC Berkeley, and I think this is great work. We do need GPU accelerator all the, from simulation to, <coughs> to real this process. So my question is, um, What's NVIDIA's long-term take on this gear lab? Do you guys want to do research and provide a uh, accelerator infrastructure for researchers and industry to accelerate this embodied AI thing? Or you guys aim to 
um, produce a high-level solution to like humanoid robots in general? That is a great question because I thought about this a lot at the founding of Gear. Mm -hmm. um, so the way I position Gear is uh, three words, mission-driven research. So um, I think Gear fundamentally is still a research lab because unlike LOMs, uh, which do have a mature recipe now, robotics does not have a mature recipe. And no one in the world really knows what's the best way to scale up robotics and actually have it generalized across system one and system two. No one has figured that out yet. And by that, it's by definition um, like a research project. But at the same time, right, like um, Jensen announced not just Groot this time, but uh, a few things along with Groot. One is Osmo, uh, which I also mentioned in, in my slides here. So it is this compute orchestration system um, as like a heterogeneous you know, compute framework uh, to schedule DGX and OVX, one for training, large models, one for simulation, right? So Osmo comes with Groot because Groot requires this kind of very special infrastructure to do. And for LOMs, you don't have this problem. You don't have a simulator. But once you have a simulator, the computation graph becomes very complicated and you will need something like Osmo, which can be offered as a uh, cloud service. And then um, the Jason Thor, which one day will power Groot on edge computing devices or on every humanoids ever deployed. Mm -hmm. So it's really an ecosystem that we're doing here. Um, and I see Groot as kind of playing a fundamental role in this ecosystem where you need a foundation model that's actually working to make the humanoid robots useful, right? Like right now, humanoid robots, they're more of a curiosity. They're not useful. Like no one really has at their home a humanoid that can do all their dirty housework for them, which is, by the way, my dream. But still, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I, I'm very lazy, and I'm trying to make sure I will stay lazy, right? So that's what I've been researching on. But no humanoids work on that level yet. So we first need to make sure that these robots work, and then we can deploy them, and then we can deploy them massively, and we can ship, you know, compute with these models, we can ship compute infrastructure with these models, we can even open up APIs for people to deploy to customize good on their own robots. But it's not there yet, so it's more like mission-driven research. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more quick question. Um, yeah. I see Jensen mentioned uh, you guys partner with some of the big robotics company, right, Humanoid. Uh, what about like startup companies or research groups? Do you guys foresee having some collaboration with them? Yeah, so um, many of the humanoid companies are startups by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, we welcome researchers and students like yourself to join. Um, you have the link here. I'll do a little bit hiring. You have the link here. Uh, please uh, feel free to apply. And I would love all the best talents in the world to join Gear and work with us on this moonshot. Yes, sir. I mean, just clarify my question. Yeah. Like for a research lab to embrace this infrastructure, do you think that's something you guys are looking for? You mean like kind of partnering with like research yeah, labs? Yeah, like we use the infrastructure to accelerate the robotics research. Yeah, I, I think that is more case by case because for the humanoid robots themselves, like the hardware isn't super widely available yet. Yeah. So, um, but I'm open to talks. I see, thank you. Thanks. Hi, Jim. Um, First of all, even I'm waiting for the robot that come and clean the house. So looking forward to it. And uh, I'm going to ask you a very different question. Uh, I work a lot with the school district and the um, uh, high school students as one of my passion projects. And I see continuously the divide between what students are taught and what the workforce is really needing. And with this whole AI and robotics, the divide is increasing like leapfrogging. So what recommendation do you have for the collaboration of the tech industry with the schools and how can, what schools can do to prepare the students? And I'm not talking even at the college level, I'm more talking about specifically the four years of high school students. And uh, I can see a lots and lots of confusion um, and I bring a lot of sessions and conferences to them as well and love to invite you as well. Yeah, um, so um, I, I think for kind of um, like high school students uh, or like education in general, um, I feel that one thing good about AI right now is that the barrier of entry has been lowered significantly, right? Like any student, middle school student, whoever, can just um, register for an LOM account and then start using this API and build agents, right? They can actually reproduce Voyager, 
without using much funding. We have the code open source. You can connect it to NVIDIA's LLM API. You can connect it to OpenAI's API. Um, it's all very accessible and doesn't cost too much. So um, I think like the barrier of entry is lowered to an unprecedented scale. When I, when I was a high school student, I did not even have access to computer science classes. Mm -hmm. I wrote my first line of code um, when I was a college student. Um, and I feel that you know these days things have changed and I would love to be young again and you know start kind of building from middle school using LOM APIs. That's just the coolest time. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot and um, love to have you over and with the students to learn from you. Thank you so much. Hi, Jim, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is about the physics. Uh, in, in the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that one of the feature of the agent is to the knowledge of the world. Uh, could you elaborate that? How, how would you going to learn the physics uh, from, um, from this training? Because essentially, you explained to us that the task uh, planning action can be Im embodied into something like a GPT, but, <coughs> but the fix is very different. So if you could elaborate that, thank you. Yeah, so um, I think that is a very deep question. Uh, I don't think we have, a, uh, we have a very clear answer to it, but this is my take. Um, so I think training on lots and lots of videos, um, and if you do a very good job at scaling up and doing it right, uh, the model will be able to learn some kind of physics. And we call that intuitive physics. A and that's what humans do as well, right? Like when we are going about our daily lives, we don't compute differential equations and accurate physics in our mind. So if I spell this water right now, I have no idea, right, how each water molecule is gonna move, right? I'm not computing that. But I, I will know that I will make a mess and then Nathan over there will be very mad at me, right? That is intuitive physics. I know roughly what the consequences will be given my actions. So um, I think models train on lots and lots of videos, uh, let's say a predictive model like Sora. If you're predicting the future, and if you're doing a good job at doing that, that means you, you have to implement some kind of implicit intuitive physics engine in order to generalize, right? You need to understand that when um, you drop uh, a glass of water, it's gonna, it's gonna break, right? Like these kind of abstractions. Um, and I think like if you are using these models for accurate physics, I don't think they're gonna work. But if you're using these models for robotics, um, I think it might be just the right data because for the robots, they don't need to compute exactly, right, all the water molecules. They just need to operate like humans, having intuitive understanding of how the world works and also learning kind of cause and effect from it, right? Like physics is also kind of causal reasoning. So um, that's how I see kind of videos and these types of models uh, will help robotics. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Jim, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, just a couple of questions on your work that is inspiring us. Uh, the question is more related to the your hybrid gradient, let's say, framework is more for me like seamlessly uh, to the reward-free framework that is in the literature. How we can ensure that Eureka will, let's say, discover skills that are different between the others? Something. Uh, sorry, do you mind saying again? Uh, yeah. How, how is uh, it? How Eureka can, can help in finding new skills, different skills between them, in order to explore better, to find new possibility? Find something. new possibilities. Um, so I, I think the capability of Eureka will also, in some sense, be, be determined by the um, foundation model itself. So um, Eureka was built on GPT-4, and it was uh, quite a while back. I think GPT-4 itself has been improved, and there's also like Gemini models and also cloud models. So whichever model is more kind of creative and more diverse, Eureka will just inherit that from the underlying model. So um, if, if the model itself doesn't have a lot of diversity, then it might just get stuck in some local minimum and not be able to propose new solutions. Um, but at least in our um, you know, particular experiments in the paper where we do like you know, dexterous manipulation tasks, for those tasks, uh, I think Eureka is doing a really good job in kind of searching in the function space. And actually, uh, we have a chart in the paper where we show that the reward functions that it engineers is actually better uh, than what human engineers can come up with. Uh, and as I said, like, you know, human engineers have to do a trial and error, and it's kind of a nightmare to do. So Eureka automates that and does a better job. But it doesn't necessarily mean it can excel in every domain. So it really depends on the LOM. Thank you. Thank you. Jim. Thanks.
Hi, James. Thank you for sharing about your mission-driven research. I'm Davey from Columbia Business School. May I know what do you think about your biggest challenge for your research from the JAR lab to the real world? Thank you. So uh, your question is about transferring kind of the research? Yeah, what do you think will be the biggest challenge and uh, what do you think will be the next step you'll focus on? Thank you. The challenges. Um, I think sim to real is really hard. So um, I do believe that if you train in 10,000 simulations and if you do well in all of them, you will have a very good chance to transfer to the real world. But in reality, it isn't always that simple, right? It's, it depends on many things. One is the fidelity of the simulation. Um, you still want the simulation to be as accurate as possible, or at least not make you know, systematic mistakes in some critical areas. And also the robot hardware itself can fail, right? And the, the sim to real, the software can have bugs. There, there are many places that could go wrong. Um, but so far we have, um, and also in, in the past works from NVIDIA research, we have a lot of success in sim to real, where uh, we do something called domain randomization. Like you instantiate 10,000 simulations, and each one has slightly different physics coefficients, like different gravity, different frictions. And if your model is robust to all of these variations, then it just generalizes out of box to the real world. Because the real world's gravity and coefficient, even though you don't know them exactly, they could you know, be off by a little bit, but your model is robust to the distribution of them. So the real world is actually in distribution of your simulation, and you can generalize. But um, that will be the I ideal case, and it doesn't always happen. So I do see sim to real as a critical challenge here. That's one thing. And the second thing is, no one has figured out how to solve robotics yet. If yeah. someone told you they, they have solved robotics, you know, take it with a grain of salt. I don't believe that as of, as of this <laughs> moment, anyone has figured that out. Um, so one critical problem of robotics and why is it difficult is the data, right? Yeah. So for ChatGPT, as I said, like you can scrape lots and lots of internet text and you just scale up on them. Um, but how do you scrape robot control data from the internet? It does not exist. And that's just one simple reason why robotics is so much harder than something like GPT-4, right? How do you collect the data in this way? So from a, um, our kind of gear labs roadmap, we're thinking about a combination of data, right? You need internet data, you need simulation data, and you for sure also need real, also need real robot data. And each different sources of data have complementary strengths and weaknesses, right? So it's so much more complicated than just training like language models because you only have internet data, right? You don't have the other two sources of data to worry about. But for robotics, you need to care about kind of the whole system. So the data problem is a second critical challenge in addition to sim to real that I am seeing. Uh, and the third is um, how to scale up. And that's still tied to the data problem, right? But like, even if you have all the videos on the internet, what do you learn from it? Do you predict the next train? And after you, so let's say even if you have a Sora model, how do you apply Sora model to a robotic stack? It's actually not clear at all. Why? Because Sora model doesn't have action. It doesn't come with actions. It's text to video, but you want the actions out of it. And actions are really hard, um, especially if you have dexterous hands in a humanoid. The actions are really hard. So even if you have all the compute in the world, you have all the data in the world, how do you extract the signals of embodied agents from it is an unsolved problem. Um, so that's why I said GEAR is a mission-driven research, because there are so many things, um, but it is a critical mission that we cannot delay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thanks. Sorry about that. This, that was our last question. Could we give everyone here, can give Jim a round of applause for that? that Thanks, awesome. everyone. Um, just a quick reminder that this session will be on demand post GTC if you want to review it. And um, the next session will be a uh, fireside talk with Bill Daly and Fei Fei Lee. Thank you. Thank you for joining this session. Please remember to fill out the session survey in the GTC app for a chance to win a $50 gift card. If you are staying in the room for the next session, please remain in your seat and have your badge ready to be scanned by our team.
是吧？还是